Hello YouTube. In today's video is something very special. I'm finally upgrading from these dinky little Synology value-based NASAs to something a bit more heavy-duty. This is a Synology rack station, which we will be installing in our two-post StarTech rack very, very soon. First of all, let's get to the unboxing part. I got this one secondhand, obviously. It definitely shows, but uh, it was a pretty good deal. I was looking at the A20 Plus, which actually has the same basic CPU as this one, this being an A15 Plus. But there really wasn't that much of a difference between them. There is some difference. This has slightly newer CPU revision, which uh, fixed the infamous Atom C2000 bugs. Which basically caused your NAS to uh, more or less explode. Well, at least malfunction. Flap under there. Alright. Well, I always love it when it comes in the original packaging, like this one here. And really, it looks like it's barely used. First of all, here is the accessory box. As we can see, here are the rack ears, which we will need. Put those aside. We have a single power lead because this one does not have the redundant PSUs. This is the 815 Plus, not the 815RP Plus, which stands for redundant power. And some screws for, I think those are actually for two and a half inch hard drives. and uh, a single key. Originally this thing would have come with two keys and a full array of, uh, of screws. Perhaps they're in the trays, not sure. And if not, we'll just use our own. That's not a big deal at all. Got plenty of screws for hard drives. And again, this was a steel. A new R820 uh, Plus, RS, uh, yeah, RS820 Plus is close to a thousand euros new. Sometimes over, depends on uh, if you get some good deals or not. This was a quarter of the price, basically. So, you know, if it basically performs the same, it looks the same, it's, ju it's just about as powerful for a quarter of the price, well, the real Dutchman inside of me really makes that, uh, that decision in a split second. All right, it's not that heavy, but it is still, uh, it has some heft to it, for sure. So let's get the packaging off. And through the magic of video editing, just a second later, we get our full view at the Sonality Rack Station RS815 Plus. It says it on the sticker here, model RS815 Plus, AC input 100 to 240 volts, 3.5 amps. It'll be run at uh, 230 volts, so excellent. Made in Taiwan. All right. Let's take a look at the front of the unit here. We have four drive bays, as you can see. The RS815 Plus is a four bay. They also sell two bay variants, which are slightly uh, lower cost, like the uh, RS217. I think there's also the RS219 at this point. It's also a two bay. I want a 4 specifically, just for better capacity and overall better performance, because I will also be hooking this up to uh, to the Dell PowerEdge T140 server with a aggregated link, so we get some uh, better performance there. We also have the power indicator light, power button, hard drive indicators, a mute button for the beeper, and uh, another little status health LED over here. And again, the four trays, which are, as it would appear, locked in place, for which we'll actually use the key. But let's take a look at the back first. If you're a guy like me and you like to look at a good backside, you're not uh, going to be in any trouble here. 
we get a fan over there, a power input, another fan, another fan, all that jazz. Here we have two thumb screws, which will actually uh, unlock the little tray here that contains the motherboard. We'll take a look at that shortly. And another fan over here. In terms of the I.O. on this system, we have four gigabit LAN ports, no two and a half gig or ten gig, sadly. And there is no way to add an, uh, another card in here. However, if you do get the 8-bay model of this series, which is 2U uh, tall, the RS12... Was it 12 for the 1200 series? Like the 1218 plus, I think it is. Uh, has the same CPU as this. A uh, very similar port layout, but it has an actual PCI Express slot, which you can use. We have two USB 3 ports here. eSATA for the expansion unit, or any other disk shelf that uses eSATA. Doesn't really matter. Uh, serial for console input. And yeah, that's basically all the I.O. you get. There is no video out or anything on these. On Synology NASes, you do everything through this station manager from the web GUI. Right, so thumb screws are loose. And now we can pull out the motherboard. And that's all there is to it. There's a free RAM cell over here. These originally came with two gigabytes. We'll take a look at what's in there now. Let's see what else is on here. That is for the serial port here, CPU is under here. They should already have a fix for the Atom C2000 bug, so that should be good. This is some onboard flash from the looks of it. Looks like a little disk on module there. And this looks suspiciously like a 4x uh, PCI Express, but uh, yeah, probably isn't. Uh, here is the ROM chip from the looks of it. It says RS815 RP Plus version 1.0. So the controller chip is probably used between the 15 RP plus and the regular plus. And the DOM here also says RS815 plus. Let's see if there's anything else on there. DSM 5.0. So that's what this one would have shipped with. DSM version 5.0. Well, 7.0 is soon to come out, so pretty good. Okay, so let's take out the memory module, we'll just put it down here. Just a typical sodium memory. This is a single 8 gigabyte stick. And this is PC3-12800S, that's DDR3-1600. Actually appears this is regular DDR3, doesn't even appear to be DDR3L. But yeah, again, like I said, this unit comes with 2 gigabytes originally, and it is upgradable to 16 gigabytes unofficially. Officially, this went up to 6 gigs. But we still have a slot available, so yeah, we'll definitely uh, upgrade this to 16 gigs at some point. Alright. It has a very similar feel to a Mac Pro uh, RAM riser. You know, in the older Mac Pros, like the 2006 through 2012, very similar to those. Okay, so I guess that concludes the basic outside tour. Um, let's get to drives so we can take a look at uh, what I ordered and uh, what the entire uh, thought about that is. So the trays are out now and we have all of our drives over here. These are all 4 terabyte WD Red Pro drives. I've decided to go with the Pro for two reasons. First reason is they were faster, 7200 RPM, and I will be connecting this to a server. And I'm possibly going to run some tasks directly from the virtual machines to the storage on the NAS, which will require a bit more IOPS than the uh, regular Reds can provide. And because they were cheap, again, I'm Dutch, I really like uh, when there is. Uh, some savings to be had, and there was definitely a lot of savings to be had on these. I think there's a new SKU coming, so that's why they were basically selling these uh, at a huge discount. They are usually around 170 euros each. These were now uh, down to 130, which is a pretty good price cut. They were only marginally more expensive than the regular Reds, 
I was also looking at the Seagate Exos discs. They're very similar in terms of capabilities. Uh, but they have lesser warranty than this, I think. Or they might both have been five years. I'm not exactly sure. But uh, yeah, I'm going with uh, Western Digital uh, this time around. I've used uh, all kinds of different discs over the years, really. Both Seagate and uh, Western Digital. and Never had any issues with either of them. So this is not like... I'm 100% uh, Western Digital fanboy or Seagate fanboy or whatever. But, uh, this is what they look like. This particular one is going to be my spare. Uh, if you've counted, we have five discs here. This is a dedicated spare drive that I want to have in case of an emergency. I can easily just drop it in without having to wait for Western Digital to send me a new drive, which is good. I don't expect anything to happen, really, but uh, it's always good to have a good plan. Right, so let's get these all out of their nice anti-static packaging. These are from different batches, I checked. It's very important when buying NAS drives that they are not all from the same batch. Because if you buy discs that are all from the same batch, chances are also very high that once one drive goes, all the others will follow very, very soon. And we don't want that to happen, because even having just one spare is then not enough anymore. Right. Anywho. Here are the trays. Here are some screws. Two for each drive. Which is enough, I suppose. And we can put the drives in the trays and uh, yeah, we'll go from there. Um, I'm not going to put the drives in the NAS straight away. First, we'll mount it up to the rack and get everything prepped. So uh, let's do just that. As you can see, the drives are now in their caddies. I did end up using a couple more screws. I didn't really feel like two screws per drive was going to be enough. These will cause a little bit more vibration than the uh, other red drives that only run at 5400 RPM. So I didn't really feel comfortable with that. Uh, but I got enough screws in the end. <laughs> they all fit, so uh, this should be good. Also, uh, put the rack ears on, so uh, the NAS itself is now ready to go. And while we're on the subject of prepping, I've got some new fresh patch cables, which we will use in the back. As I've alluded to in the beginning, this has four Ethernet ports, they're all gigabit. And, uh, they can be bonded to form an aggregated link. The switch that this will be connected to does support LACP, or Link Aggregation Protocol, or Link Aggregation Control Protocol to be more exact. And uh, I've already tested it as working, so uh, yeah, it's working on the server's end. That already has LACP all ready to go. The link is aggregated to 2 gigabit. But there will also be other clients that this NAS has the service. So I figured we would just connect all four. Also got some short patch cables for the patch panel because I was missing uh, two of these. One that I had was too long and the other one was just completely different. So I didn't want to have that in the rack. So uh, yeah, I guess uh, there's nothing else to do now than put it in the rack, put the drives in and turn it on for the first time and uh, see what happens. Okay, the rack station is now in the rack. It was a bit of a fiddly job to get it in there properly. But, uh, yep, it's in. So uh, we can start sliding the drives in, which is always a very monumental thing to do, I suppose. Let's move Paris so slightly closer here, so you can get a good look. All right. as far as it goes. Alright. Last but not least. A 
not terribly sure about this first one. This feeling is not quite in, but... Yeah, that's better. Ever so slightly. All right. Smoke test. Ooh, that's a good noise. I'm trying to feel the rack for vibrations, but honestly, I can barely feel anything. But it's definitely booting up. We have, looks like, I'm not entirely sure, it looks like we have three hard drives, but the last LED is a bit dim. It doesn't turn off when I take it out, so. Yep, now it's spinning up. I don't see the LED turning on. Maybe it's just perspective. Not sure. Right. It will keep blinking on the status because it doesn't have DSM installed. So uh, from here on out, we need to take a look uh, on the computer. So uh, let's go there. And here we are at the desktop of the Synology Rack Station RS815+. Plus. So yeah. It's already running DSM-7, it's not the actual final release version that's scheduled to be released in the next couple days. Let's log in. And here we are in the NAS itself. Usually when you go to set up your first Synology NAS, you go to find.synology.com. It will scan your network, you can select the NAS, set up your main admin account, and then you can enter the Synology like so. And then you're greeted with a couple of basic apps. First of all, you'll need to set up your drives which I've done here in the storage manager. As you go to the storage tab here, you can create your storage pool, set up all of your different settings, the rate level you want to use, create your first volume. In my case, it's over 10.5 terabytes of usable space and about 5.6 terabytes that is used at the moment. And we have one volume here. The drives are located over here in the HDD SSD section. You can expand each of the drives See what your temperature is, what your serial numbers are. Don't worry, I've already registered them, so tough luck. Health status is normal. Let's take a look at the health info. The drive is running, uh, has been running for about 1200 hours already. No worries so far. So, one thing that I really like about having these, uh, this more premium type of Synology NAS with an Intel CPU is that you can run Active Backup for Business as your backup software. I've set it up here, as you can see, we're backing up seven virtual machines for my VMware host and one file server. I'll get into that in a little bit. And because it has deduplication support, it will back up all of the files, check if there are any duplicates, and then just not use the space that those duplicates are taken up. That way you're using a lot less storage. As you can see, this 295 gigs is basically this 3.1 terabytes of virtual machines completely deduplicated. The file server here is just a Plex server, because you cannot back up a server that has a piece of hardware passed through directly to it. This is the only way to get the files off and get them backed up properly. So that's why that is. And here we can see the integration with vSphere, a couple of the virtual machines that I have, a couple of them are being backed up, not all of them. I don't need all to be backed up, and not all of them are able to be backed up. And it also comes with a nice little console, which I'll open up right here. Where it's very time machine-like, and where you can go back to all of your various files on your machine. I'll pick the WDS01 server here. Here we have a C drive of Windows machine. Got all the various data over here. We can even go back to, let's see, 31st of May, 
4 a.m. We can take a look at the performance logs here. There's nothing in there right now. We do have a desktop.ini that was modified the 24th of May. And we can just go and restore it if we fill in our password. Or we can directly download the file to our desktop and see what's in there. So if you need to get a file for off of here, it's very easy through this portal over here. Definitely enjoying this software very much. What's also a very nice feature of it is if you go to back up a virtual machine, like I've done, you can uh, quite easily press the restore button here. You can pick a snapshot, go to next, you can restore it back to the server that it came from, you can restore it to another hypervisor, for instance if you're migrating from vSphere to Hyper-V you can do it this way, or you can restore it to the internal hypervisor that's on your SNL DNS. You need Intel CPU for this to work. And then you can just restore it here. That's what I did with this PyHole Unify virtual machine. It's just a simple Ubuntu server install that has PyHole and uh, Unify controller for my access points and uh, router. And I just boot it up, set up the network card, because that's something you have to redo. And it worked fine after that. So that's definitely very, very great. And honestly, there's not a whole lot more to it. I uh, definitely really enjoyed this purchase, and uh, it's been working very well so far for the last couple of months. And uh, I think it'll last me a good couple more years. I hope you enjoyed this video. I thank you all for watching, and I'll see you guys in the next one.